three times this morning, God overflowed different things. I mean, in a big way, like frustrating me to no end. <laughs> My teapot overflowed all over the place. I mean, not even like just a little bit here and there, everywhere. Off the counter, into the drawer, into the dog's food. I went to clean that up. And then I must have overfilled the dog's bowl last night. That spilled all over the place. And then I went to transfer some chimichurri into a different container and that overflowed. And I'm really not this clumsy of a person. So when the first thing happened, I knew that there was something that I, need, that I needed to sit down and understand. And then I kind of went about my day and forgot about it. Then he brought it up again and was kind of nudging me and telling me, you need to sit down and discern this. And then the third thing happened with the chimichurri sauce. And I thought, okay, I got to sit down. And it didn't take very long at all for him to speak to me. He began speaking to me about overflowing the hiding place of the wicked. Now, who's the wicked? Pagans? Is that who the wicked are? Pagans? People who don't know any better or people who just live according to the world, but, you know, they wear it like their badge. Yeah, they're doomed to destruction if that's how they continue to live. But you know who he really despises are those who do these things in his name, who distort his word and claim to be teaching in his name when really all they're doing is making a business of him and gaining glory from themselves. So let's read about these people because that's where he's bringing me to today. It's Isaiah 28. He's been talking to me several, uh, well, a few weeks now about judgment. I've been telling you about that. I've been telling you, you need to return to him. All of us need to return to him. We need to make sure that we get in tight and that we separate ourselves, circumcise ourselves from the rest of the world. You need to clean up your YouTube channels and your social media and stop listening to false teachers. You need to discern who you're talking with and listening to. Do you guys not realize that counterfeit Christianity is the mark of the beast and that you can't just willy-nilly decide to listen to whoever you want, whoever tells you what your itching ears want to hear, you need to be discerning. No, the mark of the beast is not some chip or jab or tattoo or anything else. I mean, this is something that is far more meaningful. It's what's in your heart. You're going to be justified by what's in your heart. So if what's in your heart is that you just ingest everything and you don't do any of the things that God told you to do from the very beginning to the, to the end of the Bible, which is to set yourself apart, be hallowed, be sanctified, be consecrated to him. Be a nation that is set apart to God. There is nothing that a believer has in common with an unbeliever. Set yourself apart. Don't be listening to people you have not discerned with God. Because it's a lot more serious than just, you know, than just saying, oh, well, I just take the good and leave the rest. No, that's not how God's servants work. You show me one servant in the Bible where God is like, yeah, well, they're pretty, uh, they're pretty wicked, but they have this thing going for them. That might be your standard, but it's not God's. Listen to what he says. When he's talking about the wicked, he is talking about those claiming to be in him. These are the people Jesus rebuked when he came here. They're going to be the people he's rebuking when he comes back. And he so stated it. He said that many are going to come to him thinking that they belong to him, saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we eat with you in your name? Didn't we drive out spirits and demons in your name? How's he going to respond? Oh, yeah. All right, you guys come along too. No. He's going to respond, depart from me, evildoers, I never knew you. And in Revelation 2 and 3, he talks about people who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Those he's going to make fall down and bow down to his people and acknowledge that he has loved them. Why? Because these other demons have been claiming that he loves them and they have been persecuting God's people. Do you understand what the mark of the beast is? Do you understand what the Antichrist is? The Antichrist is the kingdom of counterfeit Christianity. That is Satan's kingdom, distorting what God established, leading others away, all those who delight in wickedness, but have not delighted in truth, those who have rejected knowledge. And so God rejects him as his priest. Is it a small thing that you're just listening to everybody on YouTube? Is it a small thing that you go on YouTube? social media and just go browse around just see what there is to see you're taking all of this into your heart you're taking all of this into the temple of god isaiah 28 woe to that wreath the pride of ephraim's drunkards why does he refer to them as drunkards because wine is doctrine there's good wine that is you know that leads to joy and there's bad wine that leads to drunkenness this is doctrine wine is doctrine in the word woe to that wreath the pride of Ephraim's drunkards. So they wear it like a wreath. They wear it like a badge. 
the pride. It's the same thing that was going on with the Israelites. We have Abraham as our father. We are children of Abraham. It's the same thing. I'm saved. I'm reborn. Jesus covered that for me. But they feel no obligation to obey, to serve in his house, to follow his covenant, to even know that they have a covenant with him. This is not a unilateral promise. This is a covenant. It's a contract. Even pagans know what those are. Even pagans understand that if you don't fulfill a contract, you don't get the reward at the end of the contract. Woe to that wreath, the pride of Ephraim's drunkards, to the fading flower, his glorious beauty, set on the head of a fertile valley, to that city, the pride of those laid low by wine. False doctrine, the pride of those laid low by wine. See the Lord as one who is powerful and strong, like a hailstorm and a destructive wind, like a driving rain and a flooding downpour, he will throw it forcefully to the ground. That wreath, the pride of Ephraim's drunkards will be trampled underfoot. That fading flower, his glorious beauty, set on the head of a fertile valley, will be like figs ripe before the harvest. As soon as people see them and take them in hand, they swallow them. In that day, the Lord Almighty will be a glorious crown, a beautiful wreath for the remnant of his people. He will be a spirit of justice to the one who sits in judgment, a source of strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. And these also stagger from wine and reel from beer. Priests and prophets stagger from beer and are befuddled with wine. They reel from beer. They stagger when seeing vis visions. They stumble when rendering decisions. All the tables are covered with vomit and there is not a spot without filth. You think he's looking at you while you're celebrating your Christmas and your Easter, your counterfeit holidays, prostituting yourselves to the world and going, oh, well, they're celebrating those pagan holidays to me. Holy, holy, holy. No, he tells you exactly what he thinks of it. He tells you exactly what he thinks of what, what these people are doing. All the tables are covered with vomit and there is not a spot without filth. He sees what's in the heart of counterfeit Christianity. He calls it a wreath. The pride of Ephraim's drunkards. They wear it like a badge. Oh, they just love it. They love prostituting themselves to the world and calling it Christian. Who is it he's trying to teach? To whom is he explaining this message? To children weaned from their milk? To those just taken from the breast, for it is do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here, a little there. Very well then, with foreign lips and strange tongues, God will speak to this people to whom he said, this is the resting place, let the weary rest. And this is the place of repose, but they would not listen. So then the word of the Lord will to them will become, do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here, a little there. So that as they go, they will fall backward. They will be injured and snared and captured. What does he mean by that? Do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here, a little there. Oh, go to this deliverance ministry, this healing ministry. Say this prayer. Here's a card. Just say this prayer. Just do this rosary. Call us and we'll pray over you. What is that? What do you mean you'll pray over them? Yes, God's people are supposed to pray, but they pray in wisdom and understanding. Someone going to pray away your sin? Someone going to pray away a spirit that God handed you over to to torment you because you spurned him? Because that's what my Bible says, that he handed Saul over to a spirit to torment him. It wasn't a diagnosis. He didn't have major depressive disorder or anxiety disorder. He was handed over to the spirit he chose. Are you different? Oh, I forgot. You guys are without sin. God would never hand us over to his spirit to torment us. He would never hand us over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, right? Guys, I don't say this in judgment. I have shared with you my story that he handed me over to a spirit to torment me to the brink of death. Do I not put myself on display first in order to share with you my testimony so that you can understand that that is the situation we're dealing with right now? Do I not share with you that I have the very credentials to debunk the credentials that I got in the world? Lowering myself and the status and the importance that I had in the world in order to say, no, nope, it wasn't true either. But see, this is the way that people treat God. They treat him like a checklist of rules. Like as though you forgive someone just because you declare that with your mouth. No, you don't. You got to go into your heart and sort through the grief and the pain of what you've been through. You have to engage on a deep and meaningful basis. But everybody's so superficial about this. God says you got to forgive from your heart. How are you going to do that if you don't even feel your feelings? A rule for this and a rule for that. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers, you who rule this people in Jerusalem. You boast we've entered into a covenant with death. Now, I don't hear anyone saying that, but that's essentially what they're saying. That's what God's saying right here. We've entered into a covenant with death. With the realm of the dead, we've made an agreement. When an overwhelming scourge sweeps by, it cannot touch us. For we have made a lie our refuge and falsehood our hiding place. 
Don't your preachers scream that from the pulpit? And then when God wipes out their church, they're like, we'll come back even stronger. They don't even have the sense to recognize God brought that. Oh, this has happened to us before. Well, who do you think is sending it? Satan? Is Satan sovereign? They don't even have the sense to recognize that God has done this not once, but twice or more. But see, they scream it away. Scream it away in the name of Jesus. They have no sense to return to him. Arrogant. Absolutely arrogant. As though they have no sin. As though they have nothing to go and confess before God and go examine in their hearts. You boast, we've entered into a covenant with death. With the realm of the dead, we made an agreement. When an overwhelming scourge sweeps by, it cannot touch us. For we have made a lie our refuge and falsehood our hiding place. He's mocking this. So this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Hail will sweep away your refuge, the lie, and water will overflow your hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled. Your agreement with the realm of the dead will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge sweeps by, you will be beaten down by it. As often as it comes, it will carry you away. Morning after morning, by day and by night, it will sweep through. The understanding of this message will bring sheer terror. The bed is too short to stretch out on. The blanket too narrow to wrap around you. The Lord will rise up as he did at Mount Perizim. He will rouse himself as in the Valley of Gibeon to do his work, his strange work, and perform his task, his alien task. Now stop your mocking or your chains will become heavier. And the Lord, the Lord Almighty, has told me of the destruction decreed against the whole land. Listen and hear my voice. Pay attention and hear what I say. When a farmer plows for planting, does he plow continually? Does he keep on breaking up and working the soil? When he has leveled the surface, does he not sow caraway and scatter cumin? Does he not plant wheat in its place, barley in its pot, and spelt in its field? His God instructs him and teaches him the right way. Caraway is not threshed with a sledge, nor is the wheel of a cart rolled over cumin. Caraway is beaten out with a rod and cumin with a stick. Grain must be ground to bake bread. So one does not go on threshing it forever. The wheels of a cart may be rolled over it, but one does not use horses to grind grain. All this comes from the Lord Almighty, whose plan is wonderful, whose wisdom is magnificent. I'm literally blown away right now. Um, I'm going to tell you why. Because I sat down this morning begging him just to give me some confirmation. He's been speaking. I mean, obviously, I'm waiting for some things to happen. But I also, he's been speaking some confirmation over and over regarding justice, or, excuse me, ju- judgment and justice that he's going to bring. And I was asking him, please confirm, please confirm so I didn't know yesterday, I, I actually shared this with the body that he was putting this particular scripture on me regarding um, what he's been doing with the body. And we sat down and talked about, well, what was, wh- who were we a year ago? What has God done within the last year? We talked about what it means to be a new creation, that you don't just become a new creation because you popped out of water. You receive that from God. If indeed you've been made a new creation, then your fruit is going to be different a year later. You are going to be a totally different person. We don't listen to the same music anymore. We're not watching TV. No one has a filthy mouth. No one deliberately goes on sinning. The way we eat is different. The way we relate is different. The way that we live is totally different. And why? Because our hearts have been changed. And so this is what's coming out of our right hand, our forehead, and our mouths. Our behaviors, the way we think and believe, and what we profess. Even the way in which we speak. And so what he had been putting on me yesterday was that he was talking about people having been given an opportunity to receive this covenant, to live this covenant with him. And we see how many are left. We see how many are left in the body. Not many, but we've all changed. And those who left were very zealous in the beginning. They knew that what they were hearing was true. It's just that when it came time to suffer for him or to be inconvenienced for him, oh, that's different. There's a separating, guys. There's a separating of the wheat from the tares. Those who responded are not going to go through more grief. He's not going to bring more grief than is needed, but he will bring grief because there is a certain amount of grief that's needed in order to make purified, spotless, and refined. Those who have not responded are going to go through a lot. Those who are not listening, those who pick and choose what parts of their covenant they're going to fulfill, those who are double-minded, those who keep listening to false teachers and false prophets, Those who are irresponsible in their covenant, they're going to go through a lot and they're gambling with their salvation. But this is what he was telling me because I was telling him, we're suffering, Lord. Your people are suffering. And we came together last night just to pray for God's people and to talk about the times. 
And the thing that he was putting on me yesterday that he was making me realize is we are suffering so much. We need him to do something because faith is hope in what is not seen. But God knows that you keep putting your faith, you keep putting your hope in what is not seen. You need to see some things in order to be able to hold on to your faith. So that's what we were praying about last night. And this is what he put on my heart. Does the farmer, when a farmer plows for planting, does he plow continually? Does he keep on breaking up and working the soil? When he's leveled the surface, does he not sow caraway and scatter cumin? Does he not plant wheat in his place? He is getting ready to do something for his people. Inasmuch as he is going to bring judgment on the wicked, he is getting ready to do something for his people. I feel like I can take a deep breath right now because I really am on the edge of my seat waiting for him to do something. And he just confirmed. I couldn't have put that together. I didn't know that both of those things went in the same scripture. I told you the reason why he led me to this scripture is because he was over, he was giving me grief this morning, overflowing the dog bowl and the tea kettle and the chimichurri jar. I'm so, so grateful. He is real. And I'll tell you, it's hard to hold on to it when you're really going through as much as I'm going through right now. But he is real. That's the one thing that I know without a shadow of a doubt that he is real. That I went to almost 30 years of therapy trying to do the things that he did easily by me returning to him. I went to seven years of medicine multiple times a week and he did easily just by me returning to him. I know that he's real. Please discern this message with God, guys. Please understand that this message is true. He is going to bring judgment. He's going to bring something that is going to overflow the hiding place of those who are hiding out in their bank accounts and saying, praise God, I'm rich, who are hiding out behind false doctrines of pre-tribulation rapture and counterfeit covenant. You need to be discerning. This is not a small thing for you to go on YouTube and listen to people who you haven't discerned with God. You need to ask him if the people you're listening to are true and who you should be listening to. And you need to go to his word and believe that his spirit is capable of ministering the truth to you, even if you're not a theologian. And I mean, let me tell you something. The worst people to go to to understand the actual word are theologians, are people who've gone to Bible colleges and seminaries. You know why? Because they're not reading the word. They're reading commentaries. They have so much junk up in their head and in their heart. They do not know what the truth is. You receive this by God. And in John 4, God says that true worshipers must worship him in the spirit and in truth, not through a pastor, not worshiping in a temple or a cathedral. In him, you have to have a relationship with him. And it is his will for you to have a relationship with him. So what does the word tell you about that? That you need to believe that whatever you have prayed in his name, which is not in the name of Jesus. It's not that. Whatever you pray in his name, which is his will, his purpose, he is going to give it to you. Because what kind of stupid person, if someone asked them, hey, can you give me this thing that you want to give me, would say, no, I'm not going to give it to you. Well, if a human being would do that, wouldn't what, why wouldn't God be happy to give you what is already in his will to give you? You just need to learn how to pray and rend your heart to what he actually wants. And you need to believe that he will do it. It is his will to give you knowledge. It is his will to give you understanding. And that if you are pursuing him and you want to be in him and you want to return to him and you want to understand what the truth is, that is in his will. You have to believe that he will give that to you and stop going to counterfeit pastors and acting like you need to refer receive this from them. Jesus has already told you, you are not to call anyone rabbi or teacher. He is your only teacher. Now go to him. And believe that what you're asking for is his will and that he will give it to you. And if you believe that, then you'll keep pursuing and you'll stay with his spirit. You won't keep going to commentaries and sermons because I'm telling you right now, no one is speaking truth. Please discern this with God.